Hey, this is Scott L. Miller. This is Sam IT on YouTube. Today I'm going to talk about programming languages that we use in IT. So if you're working in the development space, you're going to be uh, running into a lot of programming languages, right? You'll hear people talking about Java and JavaScript and C Sharp and uh, VB and C and C++ and the list goes on and on and you can get into an entire month-long discussion of just which languages are up and coming and cool and what's popular and where's the money and what's worth studying and what, you know, should you be object-oriented, should you be functional, whatever, that stuff's great. We can talk about that in other videos at other times, but that's really a software development discussion. In IT, we do have access to loads of different languages that we could be using, and we have a lot that have been used historically. But in the real world of today, there's only actually a handful of languages that make any sense for us as IT practitioners. What are they? So let's start with the basics. There are two main system administration languages, and these cover essentially all of the bases. These are the languages that are used on Windows, most Unix, really everything, even a lot of networking gear. This is the only language available to them. What are those languages? The one is just called Shell, but over the years it's been adapted and so a lot of people know it as the Born Shell, and its variants include KSH and TCSH, and today the big variant of it is called Bash. Now, we often simply simplify the Unix world into saying bash scripting, and that's not exactly accurate. It's actually a family of very closely related scripting languages. They're all a little bit different, and there's some more advanced, more recent ones that have come after bash that can be used, such as the Z shell, ZSH, uh, or Fish, and these can be really nice. But the reality is, is that uh, we don't tend to run into them into the, in the real world very often, and they're not ubiquitous. So we generally look at the Unix world, everything that's not Windows, as simply being Bash. And Bash is uh, picked because it's the most ubiquitous of all of those shells, and it's pretty close to the base shell. It's the both common and simple. So basically, if you can write in Bash, uh, your scripts will work on ZSH, or will work on something else, or they will work with just really minor adaptations. The languages are essentially the same. So, uh, in certain circles, you will actually find people coding in KSH, the corn shell, uh, or in uh, TCSH, for example, but mostly people are using Bash, and you can find Bash on essentially every platform. It may not be the default, but even if it's not the default, it'll be there for you, whether you're working on Mac, or any Linux, or uh, uh, AIX, Solaris, whatever, you're going to have access to Bash even if it's not the default. There's also the C shell, which is available on a lot of those, and that is C, the letter shell, not like the kind you hear the ocean in. And um, uh, this is a little bit different than the other shells, but it still shares a lot with them. And Bash and all of its shell variants and family members and cousins is an extremely simple language. It's mm, really designed around only absolutely what's necessary to be able to do systems administration tasks and even sometimes there it falls a little bit short but it's super easy because of this so people who work on linux often use bash without thinking too much about it because it's just always there you're working in it all the time and so it's worth learning because it gives you access basically to the entire world and like generally any uh, shell language uh, you can put bash on windows and it works fine uh, people don't tend to do that, uh, partially because it's non-native and it's a big pain and you see you don't have it most of the time. So if you were to use Bash on Windows, you would find yourself constantly like needing to install it for the simplest things. So we generally avoid it. But there's a big push of people who wish Bash existed on Windows. However, it's also important to note that most of the people who want Bash on Windows also are struggling with defining exactly what Bash is. And they're thinking that Linux's uh, ecosystem of applications is part of Bash, and that's actually what they're hoping to find on Windows, and just getting Bash on Windows doesn't provide those things, it's just the language. So that mistake has led to a lot of the push to get Bash there. Bash is available and is not all that useful. You can put it on and see how not useful it is. It works! It works exactly as it should. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just there's this imagined value to it that is actually coming from Unix, not from Bash. And so people tend to associate the two incorrectly. Um, Bash is also available on things like VMware. Right? 
Uh, so it's important to note that shells uh, are designed, are, are specifically programming languages that are designed to interact with operating systems. So Bash as a shell language is specifically meant to interact with Unix. It is highly efficient at this, super easy to use, and both are designed around each other. So it's been around for must be f more than 40 years now. We're pushing 50 years very, very soon. And uh, it's just how people tend to work on Unix. So they're very highly associated. In the Windows world, we have uh, a traditional shell language simply called CMD, which was awful, absolutely awful. Um, it was one of the big shames of the Windows world. But since then, PowerShell has replaced it many years ago. And PowerShell, while incredibly complex and convoluted compared to Bash, is also extremely powerful and is designed specifically around the way that the Windows world works. Like Bash, PowerShell can be installed on Linux, and it works just fine. But nobody does it for the same reasons. It's not ubiquitous, and it doesn't actually work that efficiently because the Linux world isn't designed to work with it. So its constructs, its approach to the world isn't very well suited to Unix machines. But it works perfectly well. You can do it and people do. And if you're really, really used to PowerShell and you just like how it works, there's nothing wrong with using it on, on Linux. It's just a little bit weird. You'll get strange looks. But on Windows, PowerShell is the language of systems administration and has been for years and it is going to continue to be for the foreseeable future. It is Microsoft's first real attempt at making an enterprise class shell. They have no idea why it took them so long, but when they finally did it, they did it pretty well. It is very slow to load up. It is quite quirky. It is still not the default on a lot of versions. That is changing. It is constantly getting new power. It is advancing at a pace that, uh, you know, Bash is pretty much static. It's been the same thing for decades with very, very tiny improvements. Bash is also much lighter. Many of the components of Bash uh, that people perceive as Bash are external to it. So, for example, things like the cat command or SSH, those aren't part of Bash. They're just things that Bash calls. In PowerShell, things like PowerShell remoting are actually part of the PowerShell ecosystem. So it's a little bit different how much PowerShell has built in because Windows didn't offer the pieces that were needed versus Bash using what's already there in Linux. So if you put PowerShell on Linux, you still have access to the cat command and to uh, SSH and things like that because they're part of the ecosystem, not part of the shell. So in both of these cases, we're talking about the shells that we probably want to know for IT work. These are the two shells, Bash and PowerShell, that for all intents and purposes cover everything. And again, if you know Bash, but you have to work with Corn Shell or TCSH or something like that, you will find yourself probably not even noticing that you've made that change. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. And in most of those cases, if you really need Bash, you can add it on, or it's even there and just not the default. You just have to tell it that that's what you want to use. So those are the languages that basically everyone who works in IT probably wants to gravitate towards. That being said, neither of them are good general purpose programming languages. In fact, they're both awful. Uh, they're so focused on being shells that they really provide very little in the way of uh, expressive constructs and good syntax that makes it easy to read and share and develop more complex applications. But they're not designed to. They have a task to do and they are good at it. So moving forward, if we want a language that's able to take us to the next level because we want to develop something that's more robust, more complex, starts edging our IT towards development, where do we turn? Traditionally, we've had a lot of languages that did this, including things like Tickle, also known as TCL, uh, and Perl. Perl was super popular for this for about 20 years. Since that time, a lot of factors have changed in the industry, and mostly it's that computers run faster, and some of the slower, more robust languages like Python and Ruby have become fast enough that we no longer care about the, the fact that they're slower than Perl. We care more that they're easy to use, easier to share, and are more robust for us to work in. So Python has become the most important uh, non-shell language for IT people to learn, followed by Ruby, both because they are cross-platform and can be used basically anywhere. They have become very popular languages on their own right. It's easy to find developers and resources for both of them. Python by far leads Ruby here, but Ruby has made good inroads and has become the second tier player. 
and uh, they are great at making a lot of things that IT people sometimes edge into in the development space, such as simple tools or uh, simple web applications and those kinds of things. They're very good at that, while they're also good at simply running on the command line so we can use them much like we would uh, any other kind of Bash or PowerShell script, right? We can just put them into a text file, throw them on our desktop, run them from the command line, and ta-da, we have very, very simple uh, scripting uh, that's just more powerful than our Bash or PowerShell options. So these tend to be uh, really the place that people start. They're also good learner languages, which also makes them nice because they're a good introduction to programming in general. And they are also the languages used by the majority of State Machine and DevOps tool sets. Things like Chef and Ansible and Salt and uh, Puppet use almost always Python and sometimes Ruby as their languages, or at least their language of choice when you're creating extensions for them. So they are very important because those systems administration tools lean on them already because they're cross-platform, so they can't be using Bash and PowerShell without creating really complex uh, knowledge of their underlying uh, platforms to support. So Python and Ruby are very, very popular because of that, and that has created kind of a circular thing where they chose it because these were the up-and-coming languages. Now they've been cemented as the languages of DevOps. So really you kind of just need to know which of those makes sense for you. In most cases that's going to be Python, and you can get into a pretty good place knowing Bash and PowerShell and Python and you can do pretty much anything that, you're, that you want to do from a programmatic state within the IT space using those tools. There are some exceptions out there. There are times that Perl might be the right choice. There are really exceptional times when something like C might make sense, especially if you're actually trying to write uh, actual Linux uh, system modules. But that's not generally an IT task. Those are things that you would expect your development team to be doing not your IT team. So we kind of have to draw that line. If we were looking at development, then all kinds of languages start entering the space, like JavaScript and Node, uh, Java itself, Scala, F Sharp, all kinds of things start coming into play. But from, uh, from an IT perspective, uh, we have very different needs uh, and very different desires, and those are generally systems administration or application administration. Those all use the same tool sets because they need to run. We want things to not have to be installed specially, more so than absolutely necessary. On Windows, you always have to install something. On Linux, generally, you can get away with uh, both Python and uh, Bash are going to be there by default, so it's just always available to you. Um, but these languages give you the scope of what you need. You will essentially never want to, at least under the current ecosystem, you're never going to want to venture outside of those languages. With this, those three, and maybe Ruby, you are all set with everything that you need to do any IT task that could possibly come up. And by learning Python, you've also set yourself up with a solid foundation for learning programming should you want to move towards uh, systems uh, development tasks and uh, general programming. So, hope that was useful. As always, remember to like and subscribe. You can comment below what languages do you like, what are you using, what have you used in the past. Definitely a lot of things have existed. VBScript, JScript, all kinds of stuff were popular at different times. They have all faded away. Um, we really are in a time period where a few major players, Bash and PowerShell specifically, have dominated and now control basically the entire space and if anything are simply getting more and more control as time moves on and people realize that IT can really make do with just these two pretty simple languages. Thanks for joining me.